to lay on them while this like well there's no plastic sticky oh yeah he loves to try to lay on them like no so he's resorted because i have this like light board thing that i do with them on so it makes life easier in the dark so i don't have to turn the big light yeah um and he tries to eat the wires to it so the thing's flickering he's chewing on the wire i'm trying to get him off the wire it's like it's a losing battle it is like i can't i love him so much but he needs to knock it off (laughs) He also loves to stalk me in my own door. Turn around, he's just peeking around the corner of the wall, just staring at me. It would be if he didn't give me a death glare while he did that. Yeah. Yeah. But he loves to cuddle. Oh, my cat doesn't. It's wild how uh, cats differ on cuddling. Yeah. Like, the whole reason I got a cat was for cuddling, honestly. Yeah. My my grandmother's cats would, like, cuddle all up on me. Oh. But, uh, yeah, my cat does not. Well, this is also what I make up to half the time, and I don't know how to feel about this. This is one of my favorite pictures of him, though, like, he looks like a demon, though. Yes, he's he a cute does. little demon, and I don't know what to do about it because his little phone comes around. He's got the glowing eyes. He's just yeah. trying to cuddle, but he looks scary. I, yeah, he is a bit scary, honestly. Cute, <laughs> scary. He is. I have better pictures of him. See, this is this is what he looks like. He's not being a little creepy. He's adorable. He's I love him. I think way too many pictures of my cats. I think I have more pictures of my cats than I do with my family. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Catch her sleeping in my lap. (laughs) She's adorable. She is. Yeah, that happens very rarely. I, I can't really complain because he loves to cuddle. It's just he's a menace at night. It's like as soon as the sun goes down. Mm-hmm. You also, you can't see him at night half the time because my room gets the cage flat. So I can't see anything. So he's just there. But he has a bell on him. He has a little bow tie and a bell because I don't trust him. I need to know where he is and what he's doing. That's adorable. <laughs> I was eating a turkey sandwich yesterday, and he tried to eat from the other end. <laughs> <laughs> and you go up there and did buy the lettuce. He's something else. This one doesn't hide very well. So like he'll try to hide under my bed, and he'll be like half sticking out of the bed. I'm like. You're not doing a great job with this. <laughs> he also doesn't land on his feet when he falls. I don't know what his deal is. That's kind of a main cat function. Well, he is a perfect example of how he stalks me in my little tree. I'm in my bathroom, that's what I see. He's just so there. Oh. I woke up to this one morning. Oh. Like, I don't know. He really does give you the death glare. He does. I'm like, I don't do anything. And I'm just existing. And he has a problem with that.
Okay, I guess. For what? To grab a karaoke machine. I'm doing karaoke and following tonight. Okay. And if you're doing something like that, well, I know you're going to rage and you're going to rage. No, yeah, you know, <laughs> why not? Just, just so folks know, I'm I'm gonna let in our our, our guest speaker to the teams. Okay. I'm almost out of here. Might as well have some. Food. Exactly. Hey, Bridget. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. It's loud and clear. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Me okay. too. Yeah, I thought I'd show up early because I've never used Microsoft Teams before. So, our this is a, a whole other conversation, but our state system is canceling our Zoom subscription, and we're moving entirely to Teams as of like two months from now. So, I'm trying to get the kinks out early. Gotcha. And it's it's definitely different. <laughs> Have y'all had spring break yet? Yeah, we got back. This is our second week after spring break. Okay, us too. So it's still, um, of course, we had this past weekend 24 inches of snow. Oh, wow. So the, 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 the last hurrah of winter was. Yeah. Long. So it's been a weird coming back from spring break because we mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like getting over that hump with the low energy mm -hmm. coming back from spring break. And then we had an absolute snow weekend. Oh, wow. And now it's in the fifties, I think. Hasn't all melted yet though. No, no, no. no next Wednesday? Tuesday and Wednesday. Oh my gosh. So it wasn't the last thing. <laughs> no. Uh, we're real ready for it to be done. <laughs> Maybe it just won't stick too much. Maybe it's probably with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we get going, I'll probably, I've got two cameras in here and I'll probably flip over the camera. So it's um, uh, mostly the students. Yeah. That, that, that'll, that'll cut me off, which, which is mostly helpful, but uh, uh, not at the moment when I'm saying hi, welcome. Um, but that that'll that's pro that'll probably be the flip. Okay. Oh, so I noticed um, looking at your humanities commons page, which I uh, shared with 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 everybody. Uh, you're uh, expected to be done with PhD 2024. So have you have you defended? Um. I don't think I've up updated my Humanities Commons page in like two years. Um, yeah. No, I, I still have um, another year. I should be done about a year from now. Cool, cool. Yeah, no, the, um, yeah, that's, that's the nature of the PhD, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know, like at some point I thought like, oh, I should make a Humanities Commons profile. And then like, I never use it for anything. So it's just going to be there. <laughs> I, somebody told me two years ago, I think, randomly messaged me on LinkedIn, and they were like, you know, your CV on your personal website is out of date. And I was like, oh, thanks for letting me know. It's still, I still haven't updated. Still. <laughs> Setting up Humanities Commons properly is still on my extended to-do list. It's just where's mm -hmm. the time? Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> survive. Also, the person that's in there, it's very empty. I've got to say, so yeah. I think it's kind of going one at a time. There were no people there, definitely. I think I'll just give you a last name. Okay. And then let's go back to you. I'm sure what's that? And then you got for himself. He's like, I think I'll just like say that I'm like, I'm 
They will ask me your height. <laughs> He's like, I'm just gonna say different height. So like, like a really <laughs> whack. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it sucks. Oh, oh. Um, um, so screenwriting. Yeah, it's best in my sins. Yeah, medieval, medieval and Renaissance, thought uh, communication theory, and then games. Yeah, I'm like really annoyed so nice. with having a bottle meeting like next Friday. And apparently the spreadsheet for Rebecca like glitched and like she lost her place. Oh, and I like this. Uh, Bridget, do you have anything to share? She like I yes, I think I know how to. Let's do that. Okay. Do, let's test that out because I have That's no good. idea how to give those permissions. It would take whether or not they're yeah. valid. Uh, okay. Right. Oh, hang on. Okay. Um, it's actually earlier than that. Okay. Uh, hang on. I may have too many, too many things open. I think it doesn't like that. <laughs> Yeah. But um. Oh, I was also going to um. Th this link tree is slightly more updated than my humanities commons profile. It's not completely updated, but. Um, I'll share that. <laughs> let's see. Oh well, now that's in the uh, actually you have shared because the, this team's chat is accessible now and. We, we've got access to this all the time, so. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hold on. Okay. I think I've almost got this figured out. Um, You know, I have a whole slideshow, but I, I think I, it might be easier if I just read it. Um, That's totally fine, yeah. Okay. Whatever works best for you. See, so we've got some more folks trickling in online and in. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're at two o'clock on the dot. Um, so let's start with our usual check in. Um, uh, Bridget, so you know, we, oh yeah, th there we went, there we go. Oh. Okay, yeah, sorry, should I? No, 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 that's fine, that's fine. Um, so uh, what we normally do for check-ins, this is a time where we just uh, say like, how are you doing? Do you have any access needs you'd like to share with the uh, class today? And we normally have a fun prompt uh, for today. It's just gonna be, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Um, so I'm, Doing pretty well. I, 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 my energy is rising the closer we go to the weekend. It's weird how that works. Uh, and Alyssa and I are finally going to go see Dune 2 on Saturday. We're, we're in the middle of rewatching Dune 1 right now. So very excited. Sure. Uh, I'm good. Um, I'm looking forward to doing my laundry for three. Um, I'm doing good. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty tired. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm looking forward to not working this weekend. Forward to not working is good. Yeah. 
to hopefully going outside more. Snow melts in the winter. So it's really nice. Uh, Dan, the prompt was, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Yeah, um, going skiing. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> spring, what a, what a dream. Yeah. Um, I'm all right. I'm looking forward to my family wants to, we always go out to eat for, for those who were in reading my British literature. It's my birthday. I have cookies coming down. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> I was waiting to tell you in person. Cookies. <laughs> Uh, Sarah? Uh, doing good. Really tired. Spanish is still a kick in the butt. Uh, I'm looking forward to this chilling on Saturday before I start my second, my second, my second half semester class. Because that's going to take on Saturdays, which are only three days. So, preparation. Hi, I'm so sweaty and tired because I just ran all the way from Dirt Lot. Um, I'm super excited to go on the free field trip to the MFA in Boston tomorrow with my art classmates and also my roommates who I convinced to come with me. Uh, Kieran? Um, doing all right. I honestly can't tell you I'm looking forward to anything, but I'm also not not looking forward to anything. Just middle mm -hmm. around. Yep. Yeah. I'm doing fine. Uh, not this weekend, but later I have a presentation that I think I did really well on that I'm ready to get out of the way. Nice. I'm doing good. Uh, I look forward to, I have a job interview at the Writing Center this weekend. Hopefully okay. that goes well. <laughs> yeah. Jane's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing all right. I'm mostly just looking forward to having time to read that isn't for my classes, which is nice. Um, I'm doing good. Uh, today's my Friday, and I'm going to a pasta night tonight. Mm, so just like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm working this weekend, so I'm just going to try to enjoy the dorm as much as I can. Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, I guess I'm looking forward to seeing the family this weekend. Uh, I am great. Uh, looking forward to going home and doing Easter activities. Doing good, caffeinated. Uh, just looking forward to catching up on readings and stuff that I neglected. On. Uh, online looks like Megan's checking in with doing good. Looking forward to the open mic tonight. Uh, which is at Cafe Monte. Yeah. Uh, Sav's doing good. Looking forward to Easter brunch. Jordan, looking forward to being home with friends and family. Abby, looking forward to making some money because you know, she has to work on Easter. Well, I'm sorry you have to work, but money's good. Um, uh, Bridget, how are you doing? Uh, I'm pretty good. Um, a little nervous. <laughs> All right. We are super glad to have you. Oh, it cast checks is in with uh, excited to celebrate my friend's birthday tonight and celebrate mine tomorrow. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday tomorrow, though, okay. Cass. Um, all right, well, so today's different um, because we have a guest. We have uh, Bridget Bartlett, uh, doctoral candidate at the University of Mississippi, working on all things neurodivergence, early modern, autism, 17th century poetry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our format, because uh, I wanted to uh, be able to pay for Bridget's time, and um, we got a uh, series that I, uh, like, a, like a web lecture series that I run called Intersectionality Talks. Um, it normally posts recordings on the web, but I didn't want to record all of y'all without your consent and just post that to the web. So um, Bridget has a presentation for the first 20 ish minutes or however long that takes. And that is the part of the video video that I'll segment out for the web. And then for the remainder of our two o'clock to three o'clock hour, it's open Q&A discussion on the presentation and on Bridget's work. Um, and then, uh, then we'll have a break and we'll uh, talk about uh, Nussbaum, uh, the, the Nussbaum piece after.
in, in the second half of class. Um, all right, so uh, take it away. All right. Uh, well, yeah, thank you uh, so much for having me in your class. Yeah, thank you to Professor Helms and Plymouth State for giving me uh, this opportunity to uh, talk with you about some of my research. Um, so I uh, was kind of editing what I was going to say up to the last minute. So um, if anyone needs an access copy, uh, speak now. I can try to upload that. I should have been more on top of this, but um, all right, if not, um, so I know those of you in this class, uh, I think read a couple poems ahead of time. Um, I won't be spending as much time in this on uh, uh, close reading those as I had initially planned, but I'm absolutely happy to uh, talk about those in the sort of discussion section. Um, and just generally, I'm, oh, sorry, it was, Oh, was that just background noise? That was just background noise. Yeah, okay, go. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so many windows open, I couldn't tell. Um, all right. <laughs> so, um, as you can tell, I'm a little unprepared. Um, but I'm super excited to get to discussion. Um, what I'm presenting today is actually very early tentative work toward a new project. Um, so, I'm very grateful for your patience and very excited to uh, discuss this with you after I talk about some of this. Um, all right, so I have never used um, Teams before, so I don't know that I'm going to run this as smoothly as I do in Zoom, but I think you can see the slides. Mm -hmm. So, um, we will, well, I'll actually dive in now. Thank you for your patience. Um, all right, so uh, autistic writers and social media users often attest to something that is quite missing from modern uh, scientific research on autism, uh, namely both a propensity to use analogies and uh, an annoyance or confusion on the part of allistic, that is non-autistic uh, people in response. Research likely uh, says little about autistic analogy use because the prevailing idea, because of the prevailing idea that autistic people are extremely literal minded. Analogies and an inclination toward literal meaning may sound irreconcilable, but autistic blogger Jamie Heidel states that analogies are precisely how he is able to quote, say what I mean and mean what I say, unquote. As he and other autistic bloggers have it, analogies use them to make uh, difficult or complicated ideas more concrete. Oop, hang on. Um, these writers also explain that the, why this concretization is helpful. Tara Vance, for instance, states that autistics, quote, communicate in analogies to illustrate uh, for people what it is that we are wanting them to understand about what we're communicating, because they always make the wrong inference. And yet this safeguard against misunderstanding often backfires. The bloggers who have written on this topic uh, agree that non-autistic interlocutors frequently judge autistic analogies to be one or more of the following, irrelevant, self-centered, disruptive, patronizing, unnecessary, needlessly elaborate, or simply bizarre. Elaborate, bizarre analogies, however, are precisely what constitute the defining conceits of metaphysical poetry. Um, the metaphysical poets often plumbed the seemingly ineffable depths of spiritual inner life or intense emotion and turned them into powerfully evocative poems that remain highly teachable and accessible today. I would argue that their poems are often not merely lyric, but frequently confessional meditations and succeed as such because conceits, to borrow from Vance, illustrate for other people what it is the poet wants them to understand. Notably, metaphysical poetry and its conceits have been appraised with the same kinds of judgments that have characterized negative reactions to autistic analogizing. Part of what I'd like to do today is unfold some analogies of my own between autistic analogies and metaphysical conceits and between their uh, respective negative receptions. 
in true autistic fashion, uh, I make analogies here in order to make sense of something and explain my perspective. Uh, what I am trying to work towards at this very preliminary stage in my research is how the barrier in cross neurotype communication that Damian Milton has termed the double empathy problem can help us gain new perspectives on the ways that early modern writers engaged with contemporary issues in philosophy of knowledge and philosophy of mind. I will use metaphysical poetry's most famous or infamous critique, that of Samuel Johnson, um, as an entry point. I will then try to cover some relevant philosophical and theoretical issues as economically as I possibly can, um, and draw some examples from three metaphysical poets, John Donne, George Herbert, and Thomas Traherne. This selection is somewhat arbitrary, but I have always found these poets good for teaching, so I thought they would be a safe bet. Um, so the label metaphysical, uh, I don't have my slides numbered right. All right. The label metaphysical was originally derisive. First, John Dryden wrote that Dunn, quote, affects a metaphysics where nature only should reign and perplexes the minds of the fair sex with nice speculations of philosophy. Then, some decades later, Samuel Johnson deemed Dunn and other 17th century poets who used conceits comparably, quote, the metaphysical poets, dismissing them as failing to produce truly high quality art. Criticism today overwhelmingly rejects the Johnsonian assessment of metaphysical poetry, but I want to revisit Johnson's specific comments because I think he both comes close to describing metaphysical conceits accurately in some regards, and also illustrates the conceit's similarity to an autistic analogies exactly where I believe he is misjudging the poems. So according to Johnson, the metaphysical poets failed to write truly great poetry because great poetry reflects general or universal truths that feel intuitive. He asserts that the metaphysical poets, quote, had no regard for that uniformity of sentiment which enables us to conceive and to excite the pains and the pleasures of other minds. Johnson regards the lack of both immediacy and universality that he finds in the metaphysical's conveyance of ideas as a major problem. He feels that metaphysical conceits are both overwrought from a perverseness of industry and at the same time careless in consisting of, quote, the most heterogeneous ideas yoked by violence together, unquote. All in all, Johnson pronounces, the poem's takeaways are rarely worth the mental work they demand. He concludes that mental, metaphysical poets, quote, attempts were always analytic. They broke every image into fragments and could no more represent the prospects of nature or the scenes of life than he who dissects a sunbeam with a prism can exhibit the wide effulgence of a summer noon. As to why Johnson's own uh, comparison here would not be, uh, a, is not unnatural as these conceits supposedly are, I can only speculate, but I think he is on to something about metaphysical conceits. They are analytical. They frequently uh, seek to make sense of internal phenomena or very subjective experiences for an external audience and do so in a highly, highly precise manner. Metaphysical conceits are analytical because they are particular rather than universal, as Johnson would like. Uh, they seek to convey the profoundly subjective through comparison to things that are supposed to be immediately understandable to all. Uh, responding to particular complaints that autistics make conversations about themselves, specifically when they use analogies drawn from their own lived experience. Autistic autism researcher Noah Adams writes in his blog, quote, offering an example from my own life helps me to communicate that I am A, listening, and B, checking in on whether I am understanding, unquote. He shares, quote, most of the time when I am talking to another person and sharing ideas, I feel that I have only got half the point across or not at all. End quote. In metaphysical poetry, I'd like to note, the possibility of being misunderstood seems to be almost as great of a threat as it is to autistic speakers. 
Think of how many of Dunn's poems, for example, begin with clear signals that the speaker is trying to articulate something that the audience has been failing to understand. Mark but this flea and mark in this, how little that which thou deniest me is, or for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love, or death be not proud, though some have called thee so, and on and on. Uh, in Herbert's poetry, meanwhile, uh, conceits often help to voice an anxious inner struggle with the inadequacy of human communication. In Easter, the, speak the speaker urges his heart, sing his praise without delays and his lute, struggle for thy part with all thy art. But he understands himself to be powerless to twist the song without God's grace. In Jordan 1, Herbert Speaker struggles with poetic conventions and effects as means to expression. The speaker asks, is all good structure in a winding stair? As though believing otherwise. But Herbert's body of often architecturally inspired metaphysical poetry suggests that he did find winding stairs to be good structure and perhaps the surest path to being understood. Johnson's criticisms of metaphysical poetry is winding stairs, so to speak, uh, also resemble, as I've suggested, those sometimes made about autistic analogies. Uh, so let us consider some of the commonalities. For one, both allegedly stray from the point. Autistics writing about their own experience report that people sometimes fail to see what their analogies have to do with the topic at hand. Johnson does understand the parallels metaphysical poets draw, but he finds them to be largely pointless detours in the end. For Johnson, as for many of those who receive autistic analogies negatively, the impression that the analogy is needlessly fantastic or flat out strange is a major part of why they seem to be self-indulgent diversions away from meaningful discussion. As in the case when autistics use personal examples, like uh, Adams discusses, the metaphysical speaker can, to some readers, seem as totally consumed with themselves as the speaker in um, Dunn being a little world made cunningly. Uh, related to all these attitudes is what might be termed autism in the sense that psychologists use the word, uh, oh, wait, yeah, my slides were not numbered correctly. The way that psychologists um, use the word before today's understanding of autism spectrum disorder formed and solidified. An autism by another name that, as C.F. Goody's intellectual history of private reason has already shown, existed in 17th century philosophies of knowledge and mind. For Jerome Bruner, autistic described a kind of meaning making that happened in isolation rather than through socialization and dominant discourses. For Paul Bleuler before that, it referred to certain schizophrenia patients' simultaneous isolation from all that was outside themselves and occupation with a fantastic and often analogy intensive inner world uh, with its own coherence. In fact, it was this uh, sense of disproportionate and fanciful autism, if you will, that allowed one psychologist in 1916 to claim that, quote, it is no great flight of autism, unquote, for him to extend and elaborate upon analogical formulations that already existed in psychoanalytic theory. Uh, my colleague Nathan Penske brought Bruner's use of autistic to my attention in his paper at last week's Renaissance Society of America conference. Uh, Penske points out that the Cambridge Platonists an important school of 17th century philosophers engaged with the idea that innate cognoscitive powers, as one called them, uh, existed that allowed individual minds to make meaning independently from their from the information it gained, independently from the information gained from the senses. Now, I've been arguing this whole time that metaphysical poets expressed experiences that were in some sense, apart from a shared or socially constructed external reality, and did so by anchoring them on aspects of common, the common phenomenal world. The Cambridge Platonists' explicit articulation of this 
autistic poiesis, if you will, uh, interests me uh, because, especially because we know uh, that they greatly influenced uh, the later uh, metaphysical poet Thomas Traherne. And I believe this notion, the, this cognitive powers idea, um, in particular, informs his poem's consistent celebration of the pre-social ignorance of childhood as a time when accurate notions of ultimate reality can be attained with an ease unavailable to adults whose minds have been shaped or formed by the limiting effects of custom and mundane cares. The grouping of Traherne with the mostly older metaphysical poets can be uneasy. He is a generation or two later than many, but I think his conceits of childhood ignorance are instructive when it comes to Johnson's qualms with all metaphysical poetry. According to Antoinette Dauber, quote, Traherne forces us to remember that the poem is a medium, always standing between the subject and direct thoughts, unquote. I think this is actually what bothers Johnson about most metaphysical poetry. The metaphysical conceit is a clear conduit between a speaker's inner thoughts and potentially all other subject. It anchors itself in what is presumed to be commonly comprehended and thus attempts to convey extremely personal or idiosyncratic experience. The Cambridge Platonists idea of an innate internal process for understanding arose in the wake of Descartes' revolutionary theories of how humans perceive and know things. Singular though Descartes may have been, he, his thought relied on constitutive ideas and competing concepts that were circulating before he started writing and persisted for some time after. Uh, among the ideas that existed in terms of knowledge and understanding were ones of interpersonal affinity as matters of mutual sympathetic understanding founded on profound levels of similarity. Uh, these types of theories I raised because they resemble the unquestioned assumptions um, at the heart of one of the dominant theories about autism today. The uh, theory of mind deficit theory, which holds that autistic people are lacking in a theory of mind. In other words, that they don't understand that other people have their own independent minds and that autistic people therefore struggle or are unable to mind read or essentially intuit or figure out other people's mental processes. Uh, Damian Milton's critique of this theory that I mentioned, the double empathy problem, uh, posits that autistic people and holistic people each struggle with mind reading the other because they experience life and reality in such fundamental different ways. Um, consequently, not even struggle, adequately grasping what those differences are that stand between them and understanding. Um, so why does my linkage of metaphysical conceit with, what does my linkage of metaphysical conceit with autistic analogy do? Is it simply another autistic analogy? Perhaps, and perhaps that means its utility is limited or that this whole project is self-defeating and understandable to no one but myself. But the idea of differences among subjectivities uh, was one that vexed and fascinated philosophical and literary writers in the 16th, 17th century. Um, and I think there is a great deal to explore here that overlaps a variety of especially um, identity concerned fields within early modern studies. I'm aware that I'm speaking today as part of an intersectionality themed theories and that neither um, the white male writers of 17th century Britain nor autism as a concept all by itself scream intersectionality. Uh, but I believe that we can use these insights into analogical expression and uh, its utility uh, to gain greater understanding about diverse identities, which often overlap with one another, um, and how they form opportunities and barriers for understanding other experiences. Um, 
I do not think, in other words, that the double empathy problem is useful only for discussing an autism allism divide. Uh, the mystical concerns of much metaphysical poetry, perhaps especially Traherne's, attests to another way that people can have radically divergent ways of experiencing reality. Um, I have tried to show that metaphysical conceits try to bridge a similar divide to autistic analogies in my reading. Uh, my previous work on early modern literature and the double empathy problem, which is very limited, explored frictions around gender identity in Sydney's Arcadia. And I think existing work uh, that's been published on early modern poetry and trans studies is one of the most promising avenues for thinking about cross subjectivity communication and even just staying on the topics of disability and metaphysical poetry, I'd highlight arguments like Katie Roden's and Susanna Mintz's that Traherne presents physical or sensory disabilities as causing someone to have a radically non-normative perspective. Or Danae Dick's argument that the neurodivergent experiential difference of synesthesia can be useful in understanding Herbert's poetry. Um, Meanwhile, the two poems that uh, I think Professor Helms asked you to read, Dunn's Holy Sonnet 5 and Traherne's Shadows in the Water, actually raise questions about issues like imperialism and religious difference on a global context, and do so, in fact, precisely because in conveying a sense of that early psychiatry autism uh, that I mentioned, uh, they each one articulates expansive uh, an expansive magnificent world that is a self-contained whole and yet simultaneously exists in an uncertain way with massive worlds outside of itself uh, posing unresolved questions about the degree to which they do or can intermesh uh, I don't want to speak longer than I had planned, so I will stop here and only say that I think this last thought is important because I think metaphysical poetry has sometimes been neglected in recent work on topics like pre-modern critical race studies and post-colonialism. Um, all right, I'm going to try to close out of the PowerPoint now. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, we've got a, about a half an hour to chat about all of this. Uh, this oh, my, my mind is buzzing. Um, I need that quote from you, uh, the, the early quote describing autistic analogies, uh, in, in, in denigrating them, because I feel like that is, uh, I need to put that on my syllabus as descriptions of my teaching style, um, or at least that's that's what that's uh, how, I, uh, how I worry that people are going to react. Um, every time I go on a tangent, but um, yeah, what? Uh, oh, and um, I'm monitoring chat. Uh, but if if folks online want to ask a question there, but um, what what questions do folks have? What do folks want to talk about? Yeah, go for it. Um, I know you mentioned like some other research that you're that you're building on, but th that specific link between autistic analogies and metaphysical poetry. W were you sort of the first to like arrive at that or to see that connection or were there other other researchers kind of doing that work that you're that you were inspired by? Yeah, that um that part's that's kind of my new idea that I'm trying to work with is that idea that I think um metaphysical conceits and autistic analogy are similar and doing similar work. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> I'll let you think for a second. <laughs> There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. I learned at least that autistic people often think in analogies. <laughs> I yeah. forget kind of what analogies are. You can need those right Brain's not working right now. I know that. Um, were there additional challenges to the already like major roadblocks that you've mentioned so far in in the research process 
Because it's all preliminary so far, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, the hardest thing was just um, in the past when I've talked to, uh, uh, to somebody else's class, like I've kind of done a short version of a dissertation chapter that I had mostly done. Um, <laughs> For, I don't know what possessed me to think this time I would just write something new that had been bouncing around in my head. Um, but the main challenge was just writing this from scratch when uh, there's probably easier ways to talk to you all today. Um, but like I said, there's very little, there's this very strange, there's a lot of sort of online chatter from autistic people talking about the fact that they use analogies a lot and their experience with how people react. Um, but when you try to, you know, search academic articles, when you look at academic databases for this, um, all you can find really are like psychi psychiatry and psychology stuff from like the 1920s, where they're saying that um, autism, which they're talking about usually a symptom of schizophrenia, um, uses figurative language. Sorry, the reason I disappeared for a minute because I knew my cat wanted to come out. She'd been locked in my room. Um, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can find this very, very old stuff saying that autism as a symptom of something else uses a lot of uh, analogies and metaphors. And I found a few, you know, relatively more recent things in the world of like arts education, um, engaging with people with disabilities that um, all attest to this fact that like autistic learners use a lot of analogies to help them make sense of things. And that's about it. Even though there's so much research on autism and especially like autism and ways of communicating language, it's it's not there. And it's very, very hard, um, you know, especially because I'm not somebody, I'm not, you know, trained in kind of like sociological methods to go out and collect um, Reddit posts in a way that's, you know, scientific or something. Um, trying to kind of show and make my point that people are talking about this, even though it's not in academic journals, I think has been the most challenging. Uh, that was a really long monologue. So thank you for your patience as well as the question. Uh, building off of that a bit, um, I'm, I'm sure you've gotten this thing a lot. How do you respond to the sort of like cranky elder scholar rebuttal that we can't talk about, in this case, autism, but it could be any number of things because that wasn't a term or in the period or that wasn't an understanding in the period? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think the simplest answer if I were in that situation was to say that uh, I don't think that necessarily applies to this uh, conversation because I'm saying these things are alike and can give us insight into one another rather than that, you know, autistic, uh, that metaphysical conceits like are autistic or written by autistic people. Um, but more generally, because I do talk about things where this would be more of a uh, an issue that people would have, um, I take sort of a, a neuroqueer approach to neurodivergence which uh, what that does is it sort of takes that spirit of kind of anti-essentialism in, in queer theory, um, that those basic premises, and extends that to, you know, the idea that everyone's mind is different um, and recognizes that we can, uh, you know, recognize um, resonances, patterns, things like that, and we can recognize when something diverges from its own cultural normativity or you know resembles what we in our standards uh diverges from that uh and discuss things as being diverging or being normative in that sense from sort of a queer theory perspective if that makes any sense thank you so rather than burning bridges, we build them. Yeah, I think that's a great way to th think about it. Thank you. 
I mean, I could just ask a half hour's worth of questions, but I do want to <laughs> leave time for thought and for y'all to get a word in edgewise. Your cat's name. <laughs> Her name is Maya. Oh, that's my cat. <laughs> Um, you kind of already touched on this, but how do you or do you act at all uh, differentiate like uh, metaphysical poetry with uh, autistic experience? Um, yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. So um, I really think at least the the metaphysical poetry I'm most interested in because I mean some of them clearly are just being funny you know some of them are more interested in and in, you know various different kinds of topics but i think what i'm most interested in are ones where i would i really view them as confessional poetry right that's a term we you know associate with kind of 20th century scholars who called themselves that i um but this idea that it's not just lyrics so not just um expressing emotion but kind of expressing um something very often idiosyncratic um, and singular and often something very, very deep that's hard to convey. Um, it, it, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to articulate. Um, I, I think that's what I'm looking at and what I'm interested in. And I am interested in how that is similar to experiences, issues that come up with something like the double empathy problem, this idea that, uh, you know, people, autistic and non-autistic people experience the world or think in such profoundly different ways that um, communicating what they're experiencing or how they see something in a certain way um, is a challenge. I think that is um, what I'm looking at, kind of similarities. Thank you. Kind of follow up to that. Um, was your interest like or like met like was the researchers interest initially in metaphysical poetry and then you you started noticing these parallels or did you come from the opposite direction from the artistic analogy and then go oh this actually maps onto metaphysical poetry? Um, hard to say. Yeah. So I was um, I was originally uh, looking at the the American poet and Bradstreet for different reasons um you know she's like sort of the first notable um sort of english colonist poet um and she has she's sometimes considered a metaphysical poet and um i think yeah i was looking at her for somewhat different reasons and i um started thinking more about she's often considered a um sort of a an a ancestor of the confessional poets you know, who actually go by that name. So I was thinking about the confessional mode and um, metaphysical poet poetry together. And I think that's how I came to the realization that there was something here that seemed very similar. Yeah. So I, I think with a lot of your work, you are breaking new ground or participating in breaking new ground in, 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 in conversations that haven't been going on for like 40 years in early modern studies, like the, the um, like neurodivergence, right? Like is, is emerging at, in it as a field, like as we, as, as we're having this conversation. Um, what advice do you have for students for up and coming thinkers, however, however y'all want to describe yourselves in the room, who are running into more traditional methods of critical theory and literary analysis and thinking, this just doesn't apply to me, doesn't describe me, doesn't fit me at all? Um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I'd say just engage deeply with all of those established methods. I think um, what really sort of made me feel like I had the, you know, permission, I guess, to approach this was um, when I was in undergrad, I took a Shakespeare class uh, with 
Matt Chapman, who is one of, you know, a pretty small number of uh, Black Shakespeareans. And, you know, he does a, an Afro-pessimist approach. And um, I think just being able to learn from him, you know, and see how, you know, at, at the same time as you can maintain, you know, critical distance, um, that your own insights, you know, as, as somebody often who has a perspective that maybe has often been sidelined or ignored, um, can be a really useful starting point in a lot of ways. And I think I um, really sort of got that insight and gained that confident confidence from engaging in things like that, engaging with um, diverse scholars and how they work with the fields that they've begun working in. And read a lot. <laughs> but you're all English majors, so I guess you know that. Read and we write. Mm -hmm. And then read some more. A kind of follow up to that. Um, have you, like, and I'm just curious if I have no idea, like, have you experienced any kind of like forging that new path, like a new way into the field, any resistance or like, remarkable support, say, from, like, peers or supervisors or professors in terms of, like, this is a ridiculous way to go, why are you doing this? Or else, like, this is really cool. Like, what does that look like, that? Um, yeah, I've gotten both. I, um, yeah, I've had, you know, just so much um, amazing support from um, faculty, um, you know, generally. Uh, part of it was, uh, you know, I, I, I've sort of, through social media, I have, a, like, a network you know, of people like Professor Helms that, you know, I kind of know um, who are all over the place, who who really take me seriously and, and the kind of work that we all want to do. Um, so there are definitely, you know, some, you know, like we've suggested, um, you know, uh, older ways of doing things that, you know, will say, you know, this is anachronistic. Um, and there's also a lot of, you know, there's there's decades worth of research on things like um, just psychology in general and early modern literature, and especially on madness and early modern literature. Um, and I, I often have to do a lot of explaining why this is different and adds to those other areas. Um, but I think on the whole, it's been, it's been, people have been pretty enthusiastic and supportive. Hi, <laughs> I knew she could save the show, even if I wasn't interesting. <laughs> oh, um, uh, another cantankerous question, not from me, but I, I love to hear people's answers to this. Um, uh, actually, um, Brad Irish gave a paper on uh, um, like neurodiversity, early modern neurodiversity studies a couple weeks ago at, um, that I got to zoom in to see. Um, and somebody asked him, what about non-human minds and animal minds? Like where does that fit into this analysis? Yeah, um, well, um, my supervisor is Kira Draver, so I get that question a lot. Um, I bet you do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's somewhere, that's actually, kind of where I began. I was really fascinated in the 16th century book, Beware the Cat, which is sort of narrated from a cat's point of view. Um, and the question, I mean, my best answer is just, I would like to know, I think there's so much work to do there. I think a lot of the theoretical and methodological approaches that I'm trying to unfold and working with other people and seeing them unfold, um, I think can, at least eventually uh, also be applied to the non-human and to animals. Um, you know, I think because we are people and we are, you know, anthropocentric, I think um, just in terms of making sense of things for ourselves and also for selling work to other people, it makes uh, sense to fo focus on the human first in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I think definitely, you know, the idea that you can queer mental difference. I think it's especially 
um, promising for thinking about, you know, inter interspecies care, interspecies understanding, things like that. Not a question, but a comment. I find your work wholly inspiring. And it's <laughs> really cool and really important. Oh, thanks. I, I really like hearing that. Do you like Shakespeare? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. Um, <laughs> it's a difficult question. Um, I like talking about Shakespeare. <laughs> Has Nick told you about their class they had? No, I don't think so. Uh, are you talking about uh, last last spring? Yeah, I, I had the I had the pleasure of co-teaching a course called Shakespeare for Social Justice. Oh, cool. And it was thinking about both like adaptations and performance styles, but also other ways of doing Shakespeare, Shakespeare in prisons, Shakespeare in schools uh, that particularly tackle social justice issues and whatnot. Awesome. Yeah, it was, it was a really good course. And it ended with student projects um that that student works worked up and sort of like a public on-campus performance of uh elements of the projects oh wow that sounds amazing yeah it was a good time it's a good time do you have any favorite poets that you would recommend us checking out poets um yeah i mean if we're i think if we're sticking with just the metaphysicals um you know, like I mentioned, I think I think the three that I sort of talked about here um, are always ones that I think are good for teaching. So I definitely think, you know, if you're not steeped in metaphysical poetry already, they're good places to um, enter. I also really like Andrew Marbell, um, but it's it's there's so much poetry. It's so hard to say, oh, I like this one because I'm sure like there's so much I haven't even read. But Treherne in, in particular, I think is really cool. He he was sort of, he was kind of unknown until his work was discovered and I think the end of the 19th century. And um, even though he's limped with the metaphysicals, in many ways, he's very, very idiosyncratic. He wasn't sort of in the same milieu as a lot of the rest of them. He's very, very interesting, I think. Uh, how much of this research would you say has consumed your very being? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm always working on many different projects. Um, it's hard to it's hard to say. I've definitely I spent like all of the past day and a half revising what I was going to say a million times. Um, past few days, it's definitely been <laughs> taking up most of my time. This is this is kind of uh, on a parallel track to what you talked about today, but um, uh, I find a, a lot of work on neurodivergence relies on like what the online social media discussion is, because that's where a lot of those conversations are happening. But as we've seen, that is like a space that's deteriorating structurally in different ways. Um, I mean, what's your what's your read on? social media's potential for continuing to like offer a space to support conversations that's that's so difficult um i mean i really i wish i had an answer because it really you know I, I i was active on twitter for maybe a year before elon musk you know started messing with it and that 
year kind of made me go from just, oh, I'm just going to write my dissertation and get a job unrelated to English to, you know, being able to come talk to other people about what I'm working on. So I think it's a really, it, I, I agree. It's like, a, it's, it's, I think it's a very valuable for these kinds of things. Um, I just, I, I don't know. Um, I really think one of the most important things is just having a good format, honestly. I know a lot of people have tried to, you know, start um, Discord servers for these kinds of things. At one point I had signed on to write a book chapter for Nick Walker's um, Neuroqueer handbook that she's mm -hmm. going to do. Um, but I find that so, so overwhelming. There's so much to process. Like I, I pulled out of the project partly because I, I could not, <laughs> keep up with the the discord um format and the how it serves information to you so um i think a, a big part of this will just be finding a way to make platforms that are accessible and, and not just like a you know clear and cut disability way but generally just usable I guess that answer was more about what my problems were with it than a solution, but. No, I think if you had the solution, you could, uh, I don't know, get Elon to pay you to keep it secret or. Uh, yeah. Like like it, it would be the key that we need, but um, it's, uh, it's still, I'm so grateful to hear your thoughts on it because it's complex. Well, I think we've got time for one more before break. Uh, one more question or comment that's not a question. Saying hi to Maya. I just think like I'm like personally also really interested in early modern studies and like it's so fascinating because I feel like you look at the field and it's so easy to be discouraged that like it's all been done before like there's so much research and like that there's nothing new and it's just so refreshing to see like such a radically new approach to early modern especially something as studied as like as the um metaphysical poetry I just think it's so cool to see um and as like scholar of learning, it's inspiring to know that there like is still new direction and new ground to break. Yeah, I you know I can't wait to thank you for that, and I can't wait to see you know what the scholars coming after me come up with because yeah, I think it's always there's always new things to discover. I like ending on a positive note, so let's thank Bridget once again for joining us. Um, and uh, we'll take five and reconvene with our, uh, our Padlet exercise. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us, and I'll be in touch with you later via email. Sounds good. All right. Enjoy the rest of your class. Bye. Bye. -bye. All right. Well, we'll take five. Uh, we'll come back at three on the dot. Yeah. Um, that cat was like, no, this camera is for me. This is my catwalk. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, so let's talk about questions. I just wanted to brag about Nick's okay. class. Okay. This was not about <laughs> fears. <laughs> That's what I'm like 17 years. <laughs> I feel, do you like that? It depends. Because I'll use over and I just, what's the on tail right now? Give me a minute. It's 35 bucks. It's not terrible. It could be worse for denim. It's not too bad. It's nearly a little too, so it's, it's really not bad. It would be cute to be It's like, I like my dad's I think there's some more horror here, bro. Uh, I miss every open that I miss of me too. Because we work Thursdays. Yeah. 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 At least we can work Thursdays together. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just so sad. And we're gonna take an apron. It looks like a cooking thing. It does. And I don't mean that. It reminds me of the second. That's.
and then what if you just I something I wouldn't mm -hmm. just be that like so much more fun. That's why she doesn't explain. What percentage of the treats have you gone through? Uh, but I, you're my only two classes. Do you want to spend 30 bucks on this? So, so. you see, the thing is, we made a, we made a fairly big debt. <laughs> There's still four of these brownies left. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> My mom has two. Oh. It's like that's the whole thing. I'm thinking of that. After this, I'm just <laughs> leaving, See, I like the um, putting them in the work area. That means Maria's probably getting all. <laughs> the cookie? Yeah. Since I'm just bringing them to work with me, I'm going to for our coworkers. Yeah, it looks funky. It tastes a little funky. That's not on your fault. That, that's market basket yeah. fault. <laughs> Where's your market? I was just at market basket. That's why I had to run from the dirt lot. I was with my friend and she like clearly wanted to go through every aisle. And I was like, we need to hurry. I need to park my car and I still need to walk all the way across campus to get to class. So, and grab my bags in my door. That's why I go grocery shopping. Mondays after my classes. Yeah, I just went yesterday afternoon, but I needed to take my friend to the bank. But I think, and I'm like, oh, what's happening? I'm only like going when I don't have class. And I don't like being restricted. I have no money. I like to go after work. But I like to go after work on Sunday when I get off work at three. That's difficult now because my mom just push shopping on Saturday morning, so I don't need yeah. to go. Interest. Yeah, interest is so, <laughs> sometimes oh, I'll get oh. back to my house. See, I have pants of Shakur. We go shopping. Never mind. It's why I live in Madison. They don't have any. That's rancid. That's why I text my friends. Do you need anything? I'm going to Walmart. So they don't have to. I'm already there for a while. I just I needed to go yesterday so I could get snacks for um squeezing into my shorts. But I forgot to get snacks, so I got snacks today at Market Basket. Yesterday, I bought like, sandwich supplies for lunch and muffins for breakfast. I went like, I have to get on the bus at 745 by silver. And they don't have that annoying. I feel like that's okay. I wake up at seven usually. I'll just wake up a little bit earlier, take a shower, eat a muffin, and go. Oh, there's waking up and then there's waking up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I wake up at seven and then I spend the next hour and I'm still sleeping in bed with music playing. That's my alarm goes off at seven. I'm usually already awake, so I can get right out of bed. It's here. Like, yeah, it's normally wake me up at seven. We're still nice. The coffee really wakes me up by like eight thirty. I doubt oh, yeah. I think we're in a cat mood. Tell me about your cats. <laughs> uh, they're fantastic and absolute terrors. Uh, we have an orange himbo <laughs> and a calico uh, sweet devil who thinks she can do no wrong and is the center of attention. <laughs> and our newest toy is a little, it's, it's a little, I mean, it's a robot. It's like a pair of wheels that can spin both ways randomly, electronic, and that also has like a um, feather toy attached to it. And it just like, Rolls around the house randomly and uh, flashes lights and uh, yeah. I wish I was an orange cat. I, all I want is a dumb orange cat. I want to name him Brick. <laughs> Great. But I. Name yeah. I'm like little. I'm allergic to cats. Yeah, brother had Catherine Short's girlfriend. My sunshine. She pushed me. And I felt weird about yeah. my like, brother. That's why you did it. She does pee all over the house. <laughs> so I need this me. It only comes from like here. When, when Dan returned, will we go on again? My guest right today. I feel pretty confident. She was like, 
Yeah. And then surely I've shown you the delay, right? I have like you have 30 seconds yeah. left in the two of them. My baby boy. Isn't that the thing? I love that. He address obscure girl. I think that's an entirely appropriate response to cat. I love swords. I love swords are a blessing. Anya did that when she was like, no. Yeah, yeah, he's welcome. I'm at the point where like Charlie just wants to sit down and then he wants to sit. Lacey's just always, no. Play with me, pants. Bridget was talking, but I couldn't help screaming, Kitty. I it's my mom's birthday. It's a step. I have to get my Such a hardship. Like, yeah, we're shipping together. I have no way to get back to that dog. I'm asking you. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if it's going to be just. How much did you weigh? It's hard to tell the size from that. I could say that I'm going to take after my senior year in high school. I was going to sell for 20 this year, and I still have to take out. You can only have like the packs in your luggage. And so to test it, I picked up my dog. Oh, my God. I'm like, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I thought it was worth it. Yeah. 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 Y
She runs and I thought that was really interesting. It's like she purposely almost like fish she knows have like not different like no I can't uh was talking about fish and like now I don't just like I'm thinking about talk and then he's like somehow like all works out like I think plus fifteen beings that's like yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and I think a mediator probably helps with yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but also, I think there's something with the high blood theory. Like she went in, yeah. she was yeah. like, yeah. I was yeah. super yeah. nervous yeah. about this. Somebody was talking 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 about this. The most ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, finding the right source of apples, finding the set, like that's a whole. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 They're not so off. You have to believe in them. Yeah. I believe in them. She said you disagree with the only time I went with you, I was like, but it's great. It's really interesting. It's just, it's all about some of the things. Retro, you just made me feel like, you said, yeah, retro, you just made me feel like, you said, it was like, enable a cloud on the line. Yeah, because it's the office. They're going to be like, they're coming from the same place and they want the same end goal. It's awesome. Oh my god, I, 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 you just removed yeah. yeah. remove well, whatever it is that you're talking about. Yeah. 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 I completely yeah. stopped yeah. 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 I have yeah. many years ago. Yeah. 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 Specifically, I read that. Yeah, like, I feel like you're still going to have the idea of what's in the world. Essentially, just like, Feel free to Yeah. Yeah. I know. I don't know. I was getting into it. I was like, oh, shoot. I think it kind of works. Scare people, too. Yeah. So I wonder if they. Said anything. Well, if she's talking to the claim that she has. Wow. Like, oh, this is really a bit of a the range of yeah. 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 Like, But it also started on a similar recent yeah. 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 the thing yeah. at the beginning, they like took some time yeah. and the I think they like had a hand down. They don't and they they're like, yeah, like brought terms in this conversation. Uh, here's some here, here's some of this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or rather, like, not gonna use. which which he thought was like a weird yeah, give and take where it like both sort of like set out explicit limits for the conversation, but it also the time at the beginning to fixate everybody's attention on the things that you should, that should say. And she right, like, yeah, yeah, and she, yeah. So she, she she appreciated the spirit, but she was wondering about the effectiveness of, it, of doing it in that way. But it's yeah. Like there has to be a limit in like which word limiting like because there's not in a natural setting where it's actually said. So 
I feel like There's in a way, like we can't. Sure. 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 But, uh, but, but, <laughs> but it's just yeah. Yeah. Um, because they're real. That's like a that, that that kind of like. Out, but yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't like. Doesn't okay. Which I feel like she loved. Yeah, we all have to get some point. Like, <laughs> like, 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 well, that's a really just fading. Yeah, so I'm going to be just going to focus right. And we were like talking about the whole premise of it. Yeah, that's a great idea. And then it's not the same thing. About that. No, that's the same thing. It's just like a quicker way to say the whole conversation we just had. But you can't like shed all the. Polarizing aspects of it, and that's just one example. Like, uh, at some point, you need like shorthand to refer to just some yeah. ideas, and that's when inevitably gets like problems. Yeah, it's weird. If we want to go on like, I don't have much down, I'm not gonna lie. I guess that's why, like, fantastic idea, but like, how does it scale to a we were more talking about uh, her ideas on punishment. I guess and, sometimes like uh, the words aren't the example. You know what and we wanted to hear from her. Like, she's the, behind the, the words. Example so of the end of yeah. Like words and what they signify. <laughs> and, and it all we're, comes we're, back to that. It all comes back to that. That's what I'm getting from reading the transcript. Yeah, I don't see that But like her explanation of punishment and uh, how she when they say uh believes or like it cuts them off and it's not like, the current incursion like system obviously and just explaining that uh, like jail time is not a deterrent or is not the deterrent that uh the current system thinks that it is or believes it is well, especially for like minor like, yeah especially for minor offenses that like I still wonder how you like like, 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 you can take your favorite food in the room, and they have a conversation. They're like, oh, we're like, you know, we're not. We're upset. We're stepping down. But then the moment you take them out of that setting, I feel like they can really revert back to the original base. Like, identity and beliefs. It's the most fractured thing ever. 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 It's like, how do you, is it like, you have to have enough of these conversations? Did that switch doesn't happen? How do you prevent that from, like, no, because I agree with you. It's so aggravating when you're like making the headway. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, I'm like, yeah, but, but you know, I still believe XYZ. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the definition, then you're like, I think that's a approach. We'll just call it. Here. Well, it's like, I. I feel as though so, like it is like kind of the correct thing to like, it's like the correct way to like talk about things and think about things like trying to make it just about like the idea and not about like what surrounds it. I also think that it's like really idealistic. Yes, it is. Yeah, like it is so often that like eventually everybody is going to be like well rounded. Like talk about uh, these games, uh, games like, ideas, and then yeah. like trying to broaden uh, like that to that huge community you know, wherever they are in the world, you know, and that we have to like, care yeah. what exactly yeah. yeah. the community. I just don't think that like you know, it's not, we're just it's listening. Not, I just don't think that we're ever gonna be there. You no. know, like I don't mind one conversation, but like you said, that was necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. yeah. And her sample, like from these sit lunch so conversations, it's yeah. still on a college campus. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's there's just, generally a consensus on a college campus that you're all there to learn. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, yeah. like there's yeah. that. So you can bed with them, like take one topic question and bring people from like all over. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and those just go off the rails all the time, mm -hmm. even though it's the same premise. Yeah. Because. I don't think they all have the same like general consensus that like this is the place to learn and discuss. You say it so well. You do. <laughs> Those are so fun. <laughs> it was. Yeah.
And there was like mild deflection. I didn't say it. It's not fully answering the question. But yeah, the comments. Never read the comments. The comments were not great. The comments were pretty broken. I also had a I had a grim Reddit thread about it. <laughs> Gotta stop doing that. You know what I think is two comments and then I don't know if it's maybe maybe I'm the only one who the Wild West that yeah. like I feel like on college campuses, especially like, reading a lot of Although it's sometimes YouTube comments are the best. Uh the like comment on the audiobook for J Air that I was reading. Things that like you're thinking or about. Listen to yeah. was like, some people wanted it to go along. When they're about to get married, like, and there's seven hours left. Shit be happening, but on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Just, like, you know, people, people almost like it. Uh, and I think yeah. that that could really skew yeah. what you happened in her class or the transcript as well. Like, yeah. people, you know, so like, I'm just cool. Yeah. I'm agreeing with what everybody else is saying. Like, Take about another maybe two minutes. Get some. Yeah. 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 I like how yeah. 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 people are on the one end or the other. Like, yeah. it's so yeah. extremes. Yeah. And I feel like, um, you know, yeah. From just from my experience, like on a college campus, you know, people are like very yeah. from choice, and I think that that's great. Yeah. And so I think that like anybody who I can sorry if all of my aunts did not feeling that way would be like, I'm just not even going to engage in this conversation yeah. because it's just going to like because they describe it you know, like, like, and exactly. You know, it's like exactly that's what I'm saying. So I have like neutral ethical, like, you know, I think. Like, I think I don't know but I don't think that's so, yeah, is I feel like the only thing that exactly, yeah, and yeah, 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 but at least you're supported, right? Like you're more willing yeah. to talk about it when or like you know that someone else is not. Yeah. Yeah. It's here. It's a random. I bet it's like a like it's like a socially called. I mean, it's that bad. It's like it's a phenomenon that happens. Like you get people in a room, and like eventually, it will come to a status like even if a few individuals ask. Yeah. It's really just a public screen really yeah he does and there's like so many steps so it's like it's like exactly for such a narrow topic they might be more likely to like yeah i agree with you because everyone else is human that doesn't seem like it's been a super pessimistic way of looking at it another class I found like the spiral silence theory that kind of goes yeah. along the same lines as what we're talking Ooh, about. Like, call cat. Hold on. Call cat. <laughs> well, that finds a mass communication theory, which states that an individual's yeah. perception of yeah. public opinion influences that individual's willingness to express their own opinions. Overton? Hmm? Is that Overton or what is that? A spiral of silence theory. Yeah. Like, it just, I saw a pillar. I'm going to actually, I, I, this is per, this is rel, this is a relevant enough tangent that I'm going to bring. It is, it is Overton. Yeah. That's wild. All right. Oh, everybody's back. Okay. Let's talk about this stuff. Yeah. I think we were talking about it. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like, yeah, it's all connected. I'll try to find this video later, but yeah. Um, uh, the YouTube al algorithm has been feeding videos from a channel that do like science and sociology explanations with cartoon shirts. It's really delightful and wholesome. Also, the, the like the commentator is British. I think it's just like. All of my like YouTube ASMR needs, but um, they were talking about recent research on divisiveness and why we're like so divided now and the effects of social media and stuff. And they they summarized some studies that are have actually said. Is everybody familiar with the the concept of the echo chamber online and the notion that that reinforces divisiveness? They summarized some studies that said actually that's complete bullshit. That in real life, your community, the people that you spend your time around, are far more likely to be an echo chamber. And then online, because of things like YouTube comments, you're far more likely to get exposed to diametrically opposed points of view, which get attached to cartoonish versions of people 
that then leads to dismissing people wholesale because of a uh, YouTube comment. Mm -hmm. But then, but so like there's some research that suggests the echo chamber theory is completely false and that social media has the opposite effect. Still increases divisiveness, but not because of the echo chamber, which is. I'll try to find that video and share it in our teams because it, it blew my mind. It's almost scarier. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Um, OK, so thoughts on the Nussbaum, thoughts on uh, what she says about bringing together politics and philosophy. Uh, anybody care to share? Um, I was kind of confused. I don't really um, remember at what point she was talking about, um, like narrowing the, the range of inquiry. And if anything, I, I really think that like a lot of what she said was like almost like the opposite of that, like like actively um, like actively dividing in sort of how she was um, like, like especially when she was talking about um, religion and uh, what what is it that philosophy? Philosophical belief where you're like uh, stoicism. Stoicism. I, like, I feel like um, when she was talking about stoicism, it was more like this is the extreme end of stoicism, and then therefore this is why stoicism is wrong. But she was really only like presenting like the extreme end, and then in the same way for religion, how she was saying um, it it's conducive to like uh, like illogical thought which you know i don't i i just feel like it, it's it's a it's against the narrow like range of inquiry and trying not to support like divisions and portions of the population you know what i mean thoughts alex um i sort of like the same era or area with that uh when she was talking about like abortion and mm -hmm. religion and how philosophy could fit into that it was sort of the same way because she called on like a uh, Catholic student to talk and she was very. Um, uh, she was like part of one of the uh, anti abortion like activist groups that was very, very narrow and it was she described it as like hysterical, the people that were in there. And then she also got into these like broader ones that were like um, not narrow enough. And it was uh, it had like Jewish religious beliefs and Catholic religious beliefs like mashed into this like. Big um, like. Anti-abortion group and that was sort of like showing that it shouldn't be too narrow, but it should be narrow or you'll get into this division that's like. Trying to bring too many things together. Other thoughts? Um, our online, does anybody want to speak up from our online group? I mean, I think I can speak to this, but if anybody wants to unmute and talk to it, that works as well. Um, we just kind of talked about like, it's not very specific the way they wrote it. I get that. Um, so like, when you have certain beliefs and you see someone else that has certain beliefs, like it's so easy to assume that they also have other beliefs that correlate with that, if that makes any sense. Um, but a lot of the time those are like incorrect preconceptions of that person, which just holds that person to a that level of respect that they aren't able to really act on if that makes any sense the birds in the british guy video that i need to share with y'all actually hits on that point and it's the idea that if you know like one opinion of somebody then your brain immediately latches on to this whole whole cartoonish like oh if they like bud light they must have all of these political opinions and so you so it's so, so like rampant stereotyping based on polarized views of the moment um so yeah yeah absolutely I kind of think, well, go ahead, Dan. I think the flip side of that too is that 
like these labels kind of allow us as like subjects to do the same thing to go like, well, if I believe these three things and this person who believes these three things also believes these 10 things, I'm going to believe these 10 things. And then like having this mix, and then even if you don't actually like, it's just like, I'm going to agree with this person because we agree on one topic. And so I'm just going to listen to what they say on so much else. But then isolating it to like one of the topics actually allows you to like explore your own beliefs on that, which you may not have taken the time to do. Yeah, that makes sense. So let let me let me try to piece a lot of this together and uh, give both a defense and a rebuttal of Nussbaum from a humanities English perspective. Um, defense. Were we talking about Gibbons on Tuesday? No, it was a different class. Gibbons, G I B, <laughs> not Gibbons, Gibbons. So if you're if you're making an argument and you have a given, what is a given for an argument? Both understood, like both sides understand it to be correct. Yeah, we all agree X, therefore we can argue Y. We might not actually all agree X. So one way of viewing her, like how does philosophy apply to politics? Maybe a, maybe a paraphrase of that might be. Actually, that philosophy can only apply to politics in a really narrow range because it needs the conversation needs to start with shared givens. And if the givens are based in differing religious or cosmological or metaphysical worldviews, those aren't going to be up for discussion because of the nature of how those ideas can often be born. Does everybody follow me there? So and 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 she she seems very she seems very like aware of the sh of the, of the of the very limited nature, but also very positive about what can happen within that small range. But she's suggesting like our political conversations should be about based on givens that we can all agree on, and then we have conversations within that range about how how government works, how taxation works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um. So that's that's my defense thereof. Um, rebuttal. I'm having a I'm having trouble, and I think this goes to Alex's example, particularly of the um, conversation about abortion, um, which it sounds like in that conversation they got some work done in getting people to consider other people's perspectives, but abortion is an extreme example. I can't actually think of a political issue that's been argued at the national level in the US in recent years that has shared givens. <laughs> like I think that I think that there are there there are there are premises premises like when does human life begin that uh often are based on things that aren't up for debate in the current conversation. Um, and I'm having trouble thinking of any sort of policy debate. I mean, do you, do you have examples? I mean, I can think of one that's not like a good one because it's like sort of divided. Sure. Like sort of divided is fine. The border crisis being a crisis because one side thinks that it's a humanitarian crisis and the other is just. I don't even want to get into that. I and this is me being very pessimistic. I am worried and I brought this up in our um, Munoz queer futurity conversation. I'm worried that for some, and I'm not going to say like the right, but like for some portion of, of, of people in that conversation, the border crisis is like a thing that's going to happen. That regardless of whether the, the facts in, are in the ground, America's under siege from outsiders. And that, like if we could carve off that bit, I think you're right. But if it's, it's like, if it's an inevitability, if it's an inevitable threat, then that, that makes the conversation much more difficult. But you're right. Like you would think we could like look at facts and data and say like everybody knows that something needs to be done. What can we do? Uh, well, one given that from like the example that you gave of abortion is I I think we are like both on liberal and conservative side is that uh, like we have a given that we should not kill innocent humans. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but that just the debate is you know what is it? Yeah. yeah. 
the other example I was going to throw in that ring is like debates about climate change and like debating about like how best to like like climate change eventually you get to a point where you're like oh you you don't believe in climate change like like you get down to the point of like the given isn't even whether you know the greenhouse effect is real like that becomes the given that you're trying to debate and the conversation goes to like well it's not real yeah which is so for like it's so again it's massive conversation I conversations about income inequality and taxation and whatnot often founder Flounder. I think it's founder. I think that's the the, sh the boat crashing on the shores word um, on assumptions about the value of work versus the value of property. Um, does Jeff Bezos deserve his salary? I think you're going to get some opinions on that that aren't based in uh the, or that that are based on givens that aren't going to be shared if that if that makes sense well let's spiral out a little bit from here other thoughts on just anything under the nest bond piece this might still actually be I mean, that, that's fine that's fine topic, but just because i think i'm confused uh but uh, so is she suggesting that not necessarily we all need to think one narrow minded given on every single topic, but that there should be some age of co coexistence that we all understand as fact, but like, I don't know if she, gives a an alternative or like a an actual answer to that well okay I, i've got a very a pretty specific response to this and i'll give it to tabby um unless you want to answer that okay um i think she gets into this when she's talking about uh rationalist religions and religions changing over time to get along with their neighbors and stuff um this idea that philosophical discourse can apply to politics, which if it's not already clear, like I think like a lot of branches of critical theory, I think we could like sub in for philosophical discourse here. Um, so how does critical theory relate to politics, to like how the world functions? Um, separation of church and state. She's saying we've all got to agree that there's freedom of religion and that you can't bring a religious given into a political conversation because not everybody's going to agree with you. So you need to come to the table with something else other than just my sacred text tells me X, therefore I want this law. Or or, or the conversation's a non-starter. And uh but to 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 like complicate that, like she brings up the like because I think the um, I think Simon is talking about like religions that justify honor killings and whatnot. And she basically says, like, if you're like if if it if it's actually a principle of your denomination of your religion, that all other. Adherents of other religions need to be murdered, that religion is not allowed to come to the table. Like your religious group needs to agree to the freedom of religion. To, to, to come to the table. Which is a, on the one hand, I'm like, well, that violates freedom of religion. But on the other hand, I'm like, that, that also makes a whole lot of sense. Like, you, does that, is, is that right with me on those, like, the, the, the wrinkles and the paradoxes there? Yeah. Tabby, you had a hand up a bit ago. That's long. Okay. I forget if it was Sam Harris or the, what's her name? Martha Nussbaum. Yeah. And she brought up, but they brought up the example of like the, it was like the Human Rights Council or like some. Yeah, yeah. Universal Declaration of Human Rights or yeah. And I guess when they were trying to, I don't know like what that is, but I assume that they're just like all sitting there talking about like what human rights are and how like they were trying to use religion and like other metaphysical aspects to figure it out. But it was like people from all around the world and they had such different views that the only thing they could agree on was like human dignity. Mm -hmm. And that was like their 
they're given that yeah. they use for so long. Yeah, which, according to Nussbaum's reading of the history, that is the bedrock of all human rights discourse over the past hundred years. So effective in that case, but also like, can you do that on every issue? Um, How can you get someone to see that though? To understand that they're on the wrong page, <laughs> so to speak. Do, do you mean in terms of like religions that don't allow yeah, for the like, existence of other religions? So you know that they're not welcomed at the table. Because if you tell them they're not welcomed at the table, I feel like that's just a recipe for uh, extremism. I don't know. I'm not sure that we have in a political agreement across the United States that 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 church and state are separated. Right. And so, like, like, um, which might be one of the reasons why politicians in the U.S. don't speak to philosophers is because the rules of that how that conversation would go. Don't actually adhere to our political situation. Yeah, that's why they killed Socrates instead of <laughs> yeah. just like yeah. uh, Alex, then Christian, then McKenna. I mean, I just had like a further example that like nothing to be given. It's just that some people don't even agree that our presidents are president right now. That's not a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I suppose from a rhetorical standpoint, if you have enough of a majority of people who say these are the ground rules from the conversation, then you exclude the people who don't agree. But depending on where the tipping points are, that either doesn't get started because too many people disagree, or maybe it excludes people unjustly because they actually have valid objections rather than wanting to say like all our laws should be based on the fact that the earth is flat or something like that. Right. We can exclude that guy. Question? Um, like, I get the idea for, um, like, in an argument or when you're trying to figure out what the best way to do something is, first settling on, you know, that common ground, those givens. But, like, at a certain point, if you, if the given is, like, far back enough in the argument, you know what I mean? And, like, person A, just it's against the religion to go against or to go with person B's uh, given, then one of the two ideas has to break, you know? So it's like, how, where do you even go from there when there's like, you need to settle on a given, but it's just not possible because of like the two people's mindset. Well, like that's kind of what we were talking about is that like, this approach while like it does have you know pros it is so overly idealistic in like in a more uh, like broader sense like when we bring it to like united states politics or um even like global politics it's like you are never going to have everybody settle on one idea, one idea. like it you might work like on a college campus in a classroom but it is probably never going to happen on the global scale it's just not like like Nick already said, like church and state are like not uh, like two separate entities yet. So it's just never going to work to connect it back to Hyperion with the all thing where people just kind of like vote on things like it's social media, <laughs> which it sounds like there's a very easy way to rig that. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I don't know that we've gotten those apparatuses yet, <laughs> but it sounds completely Unaffected. It's that, that sort of like mass mob rule. Yeah. Um, are there logistical problems for democracies based on size, communication technologies, etc.? <laughs> well, I was gonna, I was gonna say that are like fatal or that like that like undercut the entire thing or I mean obviously there are logistical problems but are they are there some of such a scale that they send the whole thing crashing to a halt like is it possible that divisiveness in American politics 
is it actually about contrasting ideologies, which is typically how we frame it, but it's maybe about how the entire system is just set up that like at that scale in this manner, the, 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 like, I guess I'm paraphrasing what McKenna said and what many of us have said about um, Gibbons, like, do you need smaller communities to have shared Gibbons and therefore you should structure governments in such a way that they can have like-minded communities? Or is there something you can do in the process of coming together and setting up the ground rules that can handle having continent spanning nations or global conversations without hitting that roadblock? I don't know if this is morbid or are we not just describing hopefulness? <laughs> <laughs> like, in the sense that, like, I, this is so, like, This is incredibly ideal for everyone to be on a general page. Uh, but like, especially when in politics, like people don't even. An example, I guess, like two, three months ago, Omar got. Uh, Deceded from the Senate um, for just calling for a ceasefire, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, uh, it's just not white, uh, got judged very heavily um, for many other reasons, obviously, as well, um, involving intersectionality. Uh, but like recently, AOC uh, just also did this in my opinion, very great speech on calling again for a ceasefire, and she didn't get uh, like uh, deceited or whatever mm -hmm. um, for. Uh, so I don't. I don't know where exactly the point I'm trying to make with this is, but like. I guess in the sense of hope, it shows that like maybe the collective is coming to a general consensus that like, hey, maybe stop killing people <laughs> for no fucking reason. Uh, sorry, uh, but just like. Sorry, I don't know where I'm going with that, actually, I think I just sort of vented to the class about that. <laughs> uh, but I think that mix of realism and optimism and pushing to move forward is a good note on which to end the class because we're over time. I'll see y'all Tuesday. <laughs> we get noir. We have a female protagonist and a male female who is a clone of John Keats. That is Tuesday. Win. Open mic tonight at six. Sorry about that, man. I wish I had. Don't worry. Don't worry.